Hi everyone, this is Jill Whalen and um, I'm here today with Christine Higgins and Lori Carpenos. Um, we're, we're doing a talk called uh, Relationship Rehab. Um, and, and we're just going to be talking about um, ro oh, romantic relationship rehab, I think it's called. And we're going to be talking about those types of relationships today as a prelude to our seminar, our one-day workshop that we're doing on November 4th, I believe, a Saturday in, in um, Hartford, Connecticut. So this will give you a little bit of a taste of, of, of what we're going to do. And... Um, we hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Lori now, and uh, she's going to just tell you a little bit about herself and what she's up to and, and, and relationships. Go ahead, Lori. Oh, thanks, Jill. Yeah, this is fun. Uh, where to start? Well, I'll start with the fact that uh, just last night, so this is really timely. Just last night, we sent off our final copy of our relationship book that Christine Heath and I wrote called The Secret of Love. So that's been a long process of editing and just um, gathering stories from so many people whose relationships transformed in incredible ways. And the, the simplicity behind how that happened was so striking that uh, Chris and I just knew we had to write it up. We're both marriage and family therapists. And the book began with just um, a small compilation of client stories because we would just talk to them about how their innate health works, how their experience of one another is coming from them. It's always, always, always. And this is, you know, a point I cannot underscore enough. But everyone's romantic relationship comes from within their own mind. It appears as though it's coming from their partner. Because everyone who comes in my counseling door, and Chris says exactly the same thing, they're like pointing at each other. If you can fix him, if you can fix her, then we'll be fine. Just fix the other person. I'm, I'm good. It's, it's all the problems of the other person. So we chuckle, of course, because we know where that's coming from. That's coming from this inside out view of life that every human being has, whether they know it or not. And that was discovered in 1973 by a man named Sidney Banks. For those of you who are not familiar with his discovery or uncovering of mind, thought, and consciousness, which are called the three principles and created a paradigm shift in um, psychology. So, um, I just want to give that little brief intro, and then I want to pass it along to Chris, and then we're the three of us are going to just have a conversation. Uh, oh. One thing I just want to add that it's just going to be the three of us on this uh, webinar because I had a technological glitch, which doesn't allow for other people to be on, as far as I can tell, but. Um, we're, we're going to, we have, we are recording it so people can watch this after the fact. Okay, Chris. Great. Thanks. And Lori, actually, I had a question for you. Do you have a particular story from your book that you can share with us today? Is that something you can do? Was there something that really stood out to you as you were writing that? Absolutely. I mean, there are so many stories in there. Um, but let me see as we go on, as a story comes to me, you know, maybe something you say, Chris, or something Jill says will spark off a particular story. So sure. I'll kind of have my mind engineered to <laughs> have that come to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love what you said about, you know, it's always, you know, we're always looking in the other, at the other people around us, you know, and even when, you know, there is a lot of, there are a lot of people that have been talking about, oh, well, you can, 
you know, the circle of influence. You can only change yourself. So, you know, focus on yourself. Oh, hi. Oh, that's <laughs> I didn't think this could happen. Great. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time um, with, I've been married 17 years now, and I spent a lot of time trying to fix myself. You know, because there is a school of thought out there that, you know, that does agree that you can't change other people, you know, in this circle of influence, you can only change yourself. So I spent a lot of time trying to change myself um, to improve my relationship, my romantic relationship. And trying to change yourself is a lot of work. And it also, means that you're still trying, you're still seeing the other person as the problem usually. And you're trying to change how you're reacting to that other person, you know, like, oh, I shouldn't think that about them. I shouldn't say that to them. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, or I should, I should, I should. And the thing that I found to be such a relief, once I understood where my experience was coming from, which as Lori pointed out, is always coming from within. At that point, I was able to understand that I was just having a human experience and that I didn't have to do any fixing of the other person or of myself, that that was just part of being human and I was going to experience the other person in whatever way I experienced them and I didn't have to change that, which is a lot more freeing to just be in your relationship and experience it without so much judgment around it, um, either towards yourself or the other person. And so I think that was a big, a big aha moment for me was just recognizing that there, if I'm not having to work so hard, I can just relax and enjoy being in the relationship and being present to the other person. Um, it, was a, it was a different way it, and of coming at it that was much more effective and a lot less work. That's really interesting because I have a, um, a little bit different um, situation where um, I don't know if I, I, I wouldn't say that it was like a trying, <clears throat> a trying to do anything, but you know, just, just like you said at first, with, um, you know, I was always thinking, oh, you know, for my husband, and I've been married 34 years, um, you know, think, thinking, oh, if, if only he knew this stuff that I've learned that, you know, it's, mm. it's coming, that, that the world is coming from, from his own thoughts and not, not me or not his situations. Like, if only he knew this, like, then, then our relationship would be great. And, and it, you know, the first year or so that I, uh, I was learning this, that's, that's what I thought. And, and it wasn't until I did look towards myself that things were able to change. And for me, what, what really was a, a big game changer was realizing that I had a, um, well, a, an, an image of, of my husband, you know, we'd been together so long and, and I had this image of him that, that ha I had created in my head based on, you know, everything that's gone on in our, our lives together. And, um, and of course, you know, things have changed. He's changed and, and, but my image sort of stayed the same. And um, I also have an image of myself in my head that, you know, we, that we have, it's like this identity that we, we always have this identity of ourselves. And, um, but you don't really realize how much you do that with other people. So when I started to loosen my image of him in my head a little bit like this identity that I created he's mean or he's you know he's oh yeah this um like I loosen that up and said well let's let's keep this open you know maybe he's not mean you know other people <laughs> don't seem to think he's mean you know or, or what, whatever it was and like that like magic he magically changed um oops I think we lost Lori well she'll come back um but like before my eyes just by changing the image in my head and it wasn't like a doing either, you know, I mean, like you said, Christine, it, you know, I mean, it, I don't know that it was a conscious doing, but that's sort of the, it looked, you know, dissecting it later, that's kind of what happened um, after the fact. And um, 
it's just it, to me that's like the the miracle that what can happen when you you know just just loosen up what you think about other people i don't you know and it, what like i said it wasn't a conscious thing but that to me that made so much difference and i i've seen now because this was probably a couple of years ago already i've realized i've started you know forming new images again in my head i have to uh you know i, I sort of remember wait a minute you know just keep things loose and, and fluid and and um you know you can see when things start to get tight in the relationship oh okay i must be doing that again and uh loose keep it loose a little bit and um and then you know everything's good again <laughs> it's just very miraculous we yeah. lost you there for a minute Lori. i think it's really a moment to moment uh, um, experience between two people and when you know that it's easy to um forgive the other person and move on because you realize that they were in a difficult moment we all have difficult times we all have difficult moments and it's easier to overlook that and chalk it up to just that a, a difficult moment the other person is caught up in their thinking or i'm caught up in my thinking and that's all it is you know the main point of our entire book which is a quote by sydney banks is that the only thing wrong with your relationship is negative thinking and I can't tell you how true that is. Uh, I look back on my life. I, I am divorced. I had one marriage. And um, as I look back and realize, first of all, I realize that I could be happy whether I'm married or single. That's so important for, for people yeah. to know. People think that, you know, if only they were single, they'd be happy. Or if only they were coupled, they'd be happy. <laughs> neither of those are true it's our own thinking that is going to give us the experience of happiness or not and i'm not talking about positive thinking i'm talking about just knowing that that's true for all humans so as i look back i realized you know i could have stayed married uh it was nothing uh traumatic that occurred for either of us but um we just didn't know back then that it was our thinking and my ex-husband moved on he is in a marriage that um is doing fine you know we all evolve and grow as far as i know <laughs> it's doing fine <laughs> um so we all evolve and grow and and realize and even my understanding of the principles has grown so much it's deepened so much in the in the last 30 years and probably even within the last few years while writing this book um and you know being able to interview people whose relationships change remarkably simply by understanding that it's all coming from within them so i just want to pause for a moment and say hello to christian we caught <laughs> you in the middle of a bite. Um, so I'm sorry. Glad you, uh, were able to join us. We had a, uh, I should say, I had a technological glitch setting it up so people weren't able to register and we were asking people to register. Anyway. Oh, sorry. I just. So that's well, you were fine, Christian. <laughs> I just I just came in and yeah I put it I put it up on Facebook for anyone to join. Mm. Yeah, sorry I just I saw that and I just um, joined and I'm, I'm I'm forgive me I'm eating a snack because I've got yoga after this and then I'm working tonight. So <laughs> I just want to be to get some food on board. <laughs> do, you, do you have any questions or anything for us? Um, no, no, not really. I'm just I'm I'm just uh, interested. I and you know I wasn't sure if I'd be. I wasn't sure how long this client would go and whether I'd be around this afternoon. So I thought I just, since I saw you were doing it, I thought I'd join up. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, feel free to just listen in. And if you, if you, you know, have a question or comment later, let, you know, Ooh. just chime in. Thank you. Yeah. How long are you going? How, how long is your webinar? Just an hour. So mm. another 45 minutes. Mm. 
and you guys are doing a, a workshop in in New England. Yes, right. And you're November in England, I think. Mm -hmm. you're doing it in Connecticut. Are you in England? I'm in Scotland. Scotland. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christian took me all around um, Glasgow when I was visiting. Look, look, look it's the sun is shining today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Lovely. Christian. You know, something just came to my mind that I think will be helpful for all of us. And that is, um, Christine had asked me earlier if there were any stories from the book that came to mind. And the, the first one is, that uh, opens up our book is Elsie and uh, her husband, Ken. Mm. So most people who have been studying and been involved in the three principles know Elsie Spittle. She's written several books and she is, um, she was closest to Sid um, throughout all the years, even before he had his experience. And so the, she and Ken were, were talking on a telephone interview I did with them. And Elsie said, there is no way they would be married today had they not met Sid and had they not learned from Sid what they learned about this inside out experience of life. And Ken said, that's absolutely true. And they were married 50 years at the time. So this dates back a couple of years ago when I did this interview. They celebrated now, I guess, their 52nd anniversary. <laughs> and they both said, and this really struck me, it's better today, 50 years into a marriage, than it was at the beginning. You know, I mean, that's really something that um, people, and they were, and it's in my book, so it's public knowledge. Um, they were all set to be divorced. And it's a very sweet story that they have. So no matter where a relationship is right now, um, it can be rehabbed. <laughs> <laughs> really, just with understanding, and it only takes one person. That's another remarkable thing. I'm trying to think of, there were a few people who said that. Well, um, um, oh God, I can't think right now who it was, but oh, Dickon, Dickon Bedinger. He was the only one in his family who was learning about the principles and their story is also in the book. And Dickin, um, because uh, how much he changed, he affected everybody else. And then people in the family, his wife and his children, wanted to know what he was learning. It, it works best when somebody asks. You know, it's great to share Um when you're excited about something and you're learning something, but you also want to be very um, understanding of your partner's position. <laughs> um, Jan and Chip have a funny story about that because Jan got very touched, wound up at a, a lecture by Sid and was very, very touched. And she and Chip were in a really bad way. And she came home so excited that she had, she really felt like she found what the two of them had been looking for, for years to, to save their marriage. And Chip would have nothing of it, nothing of it. In fact, it made him angry, angrier to hear, you know, how can you be so positive? That's insane. So you want to just be very sensitive and just, live what you're learning, what you're understanding about how your experience is always coming from your own thinking, good, bad, or indifferent. And it's so great that we feel what we think. It, it's a one-to-one -one connection. So we'll know our feeling 
before we are even aware of what we're thinking quite often. But that feeling is a signal that will tip you off to what's going on inside your own mind. It's not how we've been looking at it. We, the way we looked at it before this understanding, and I'll speak for myself, I think Jill and Christine and Christian, you would agree, but the way I looked at it before this understanding was if I'm feeling bad, it's because of the thing out there that I'm thinking about. Either my partner or an event that just happened. But then I realized, well, I'm thinking about my partner negatively, even when he's not in the room with me. Yeah. Over something that happened, you know, months ago. That's crazy. When it comes down to it, that's crazy. But we all have that tendency to do that it looks as though we are getting what's out there and that's not how it works it works opposite absolutely opposite to that and and the beauty of of knowing that is that it does just take one to tango <laughs> and uh and and it, it it makes you no longer a, a victim of your circumstances because you, you know, it, 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 you're not it, what people around you are doing or saying or whatever. It can't necessarily affect your state of mind unless, you know, you're, 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 you're in charge. They're not, they're not the ones creating your feelings. Your own thoughts are, and it's so empowering. And, and, and that's, you know, it, it, it's, it really does take one to change a relationship. It's just a, your own shift in perspective. Somehow if new, you know, new thoughts come in and suddenly the relationship looks completely different. Um, it's, it, it, I, I think the marriage rate would be a lot, the divorce rate would go down a lot if more people understood this, that it wasn't their partner making them unhappy. It would be amazing. <laughs> The word that's coming to me as I'm listening to the two of you um, is the word innocence, because that's been really huge, is that as soon as you get where your experience is coming from, then the other person looks innocent. You yourself are innocent, because it's just, you know, you, you're not controlling your thoughts or doing anything. It's just your experience. And when you start conversations from a place of innocence, and not just like an assumed innocence is a concept, you know, but really, truly, you're both innocent and just having experiences. The conversations that fall out of that space um, are not only more interesting, but really deepen the understanding and the connection that the two of you can have. Because when you do think it's the other person, it's really hard to come to a conversation with the, well, you don't, you simply don't. When it's the other person, you don't come to the conversation with assumed innocence. <laughs> yeah, there's, and, um, and curiosity also. You start getting curious about the other person's experience, their perspective, um, and, and and who they are in that moment. Oh yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, yeah, that's a that's a wonderful word, innocence. I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Christine. Because so often we assume that you know, somebody else, the other person in our relationship is, is like out to get us or, yes. or something like they want to be mean, you know, or, or they, you know, or they purposely got angry or they, you know, like, like we just think that they purposely doing stuff to us because it's all, you know, why me <laughs> mentality. And yeah, if you see their innocence, they're just human beings who just want to be loved, just like everybody else. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. So much of our behavior, it seems to me, comes from our insecurities, our insecure thinking um, of, of just wanting to feel loved. And, and if we can feel that from our partner, like it just 
you know, if we can do that for them by no, because we know this, then that changes them too miraculously by, because they're, they're getting, they're just feeling that love that instead of us being mad at them for being mad at us or, you know, it, it, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. And it's just, yeah, like if we just all could not assume, uh, like you say, with the innocence, not assume the worst, assume, assume the best. And it's just, a, you know, they're just caught up in their thinking um, in, innocently and that mm -hmm. created their behavior. Yeah, for the longest time. Um, so my husband and I have gotten over a rocky patch. We were at the point where we were at a divorce mediator even. And one of the things I'd been asking him for 12 years to take me on a date. So in the beginning, I pursued him and, you know, caught the fish, so to speak. <laughs> and, and then we had kids and then we went into, you know, what I call business mode. You know, it's all about getting stuff done, making sure everyone's fed, you know, making money, all those things, business mode. and. I was feeling pretty tired and I was like, I just want him to take me on a date. I want him to organize the babysitting, to choose where we're going to go and just take me on a date. And, and I asked, this was my request for 12 years. This is not like a request that I made once. This was a 12 year request. And we got to the divorce mediator and she's looking at him going, why? just take her on a date already. <laughs> and, and so that was his assignment was to take me on a date. And he, and I saw him trying to plan it and he was sweating buckets. Now this is a person who works on, you know, $50 million contracts. This is a person who's does, gets a lot done in the business world. And he was, I had to help him. In the end, I had to help him. Planning a date was more than he could take on. And, um, and even, though, even though I had this understanding, even at that time, um, it really brought home that concept of innocence. Because to me, what I was asking was so simple. But in his worldview, in his experience, where his thinking was, doing that task was not simple. That wasn't easy. And eventually, it took months, but we talked through it, and I found out that he didn't think it could be that easy. In his mind, you know, just picking a place to go and taking me out wouldn't satisfy the requirements, you know he had some idea about what a date needed to look like and it was very complicated and difficult and had all these things attached to it. Um, so it's just, yeah. So, and, and so that was something that for 12 years we'd been, you know, beating on and beating on and beating on and it um, took stepping back and really seeing that he was innocent. He wasn't trying to piss me off. He wasn't trying to be annoying. He truly, in his mind, that was not easy. And that's, and that's so. really a, a case of the separate realities. Like we, yep. we, we assume that everybody thinks the way we do, you know, like it's easy to plan a date, you know, yeah. it's easy. I do it all the time. You, you know, you think in your head <laughs> and, yeah. and so you just assume, well, he must not love me you know? <laughs> instead of it's just overwhelming for him. You know, it's so funny because we, we think everything we think we think is, is right. And the, the truth of everything. <laughs> and yet it's just our own teeny little bit of, 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 of the world. And it's not even, it's not even right. There is no right. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. That, yeah. Isn't Go it on. amazing what you can find out from the other person when you, just assume innocence because then you're going to be curious and ask, you know, that would, knowing what you know now, I'm sure you would get curious about that. Why is he not 
doing this simple thing that I'm asking. <laughs> it just seems so, you know, it would be hard for someone who thinks planning a date is so simple. It would be hard for that person to imagine that it, why, why is he dragging his feet on this? And so the tendency is to fill in your own questions, fill in the blanks with some negative thinking, like mm -hmm. Jill said, it must be because he doesn't love me or he doesn't care enough or he's more interested in his work or whatever we fill in what we don't know with our own mm -hmm. thinking and believe that thinking we're doing as the reality. Whatever we think looks real and the three principles explain how that works whatever we think looks real because we're conscious of our thinking. That's how we get a reality every moment of our lives. So of course, somebody who doesn't realize that they're filling in these blanks, these, you know, that we don't know, there are always variables in the other person's mind that we don't know about. And for 12 years, I filled in the blanks for a very, yeah. very long time. I was filling, and it never, ever, I think it's one of those things because it's, it's so easy for me. It never, ever, ever crossed my mind that someone else could think that that was difficult, ever. And you don't know unless you ask. Right. You know, curiosity. Seeing innocence spurs curiosity. Like, you get really curious what's going on for him that he's not hearing me or doesn't want to. So then you ask, you just ask a simple question. And that question is not going to be coming from anger. Mm -mm. If you're assuming bad things, that question would come from anger. But yeah. if you're in neutral with no assumptions, having no idea what's going on in his mind, then the question is going to be from love mm -hmm. and interest and curiosity. And, you know, to find out that this big guy who is successful in business and, you know, runs all of these contracts and finds creating a simple date, a test because of what's going on in his mm -hmm. mind, that it had to be a certain way that, mm -hmm. Oh, this is like planning a honeymoon or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and well, then that's when you funny. answer, it just gets you more connected because you feel his, you know, you feel how sweet that is. That's just so, yeah. yeah. So innocent. And that's actually pretty hilarious that you said that because he actually did plan our honeymoon and did an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and he probably didn't know if you, even if you did ask him, which you may have even, you know, he probably didn't know why he couldn't do it either. And and, and, that, prop, and that made him feel, you know, his own thinking about that too. Like, because he, in his mind, it, ha it would probably be simple too. Like, why yeah. can't I do this? I remember when, you know, when I was first married or we had first had the kids and the house was always like such a mess but I just could not, it was too overwhelming for me. And it used to be like such a sore point. You know, my husband would come home and get mad because the house was a mess, but mm -hmm. I could not keep up with it. I just couldn't, I just wasn't, you know, it seems so ridiculous, but I just couldn't do it. And it was that feeling of like, why can't I do this? I don't know, but you know, it just, <laughs> people, people get overwhelmed by different things. Yeah. Well, we don't always, especially if you don't know where your experience comes from, you don't know to look to your thinking, right? And so when, when you're thinking you should be able to do something and there's something stopping you, you don't even know where to look. You don't, you, you don't. And so, yeah, so you kind of end up in a, a bit of a stuck place. It's that old term denial, right? You just go into... Um, it's, it's what our psychological makeup does for us. It kind of blocks out whatever we can't deal with in the moment. We don't even know that, you know, we can't deal with this thing. Does that make sense? I think so. You're saying that we, because we're not, we 
just have the feeling of overwhelm, but not knowing where it comes from. So yeah, so then you kind of shut down. It's just like, get this feeling overwhelm and then blank screen, just because you can't deal with it. Is that what you're saying, Lori? Is that another exactly. way of saying it? Right, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like we can't do anything with something that's not on our screen, you know, like right. a computer screen if it's not there. And that's the innocence, too. Mm -hmm. that if you don't, if it's not in your mind, there's no blame for that. It's not like we push a button and say, okay, I don't want this to be in my mind, so I'm taking it off the screen. <laughs> it just isn't there. And wow, what a difference that makes for relationships. And you experienced it firsthand. Christine. Oh, completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, and that was the other thing, um, you know, and for a while, you know, I think what you said, Jill, was really um, helpful because for a while, I didn't understand either why he couldn't tell me why he couldn't do it. You know, I'm like, because, of course, in 12 years, I at least asked, like, well, why not? <laughs> and there was no real answer. Just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, yeah. And, and, um, and, and when, because we, we have all these thoughts, when we don't know our feelings, like the feeling of overwhelm is com comes from thought, and we don't know, like, all those thoughts that go on in the back of our head when, we're, when we're, we don't have a clear mind, like, I can see such a difference now in my head. My head is generally clear these days because I'm aware of, of my thoughts more. And, and so the overwhelm, like, like, there's no way to know what that is. You just know you feel something. But if you don't realize that your feelings come from your thought in the moment, you just don't know. You don't know what's going on. And, and yeah, so, like, just being aware that when we know our thoughts are creating our experience and being more aware for me at least just being aware that I was thinking seemed to clear my mind so much more and and now now I, I mean even I can I still get caught up all the time and still think you know stuff's coming from my husband but there's a part of me that knows well it can't be so you know I can try and look at it a different way or, or at least later when it's you know when, when things have settled down a bit see how oh that's how it came from me it wasn't it wasn't him it came from me and you know and and Lori like you said with Chip and Jan you know their relationship um and and with um Elsie you know I mean that I would say the same for my relationship I mean because before it was such a it was just a codependent relationship I, I would say now looking back like it was this addictive thing, you know, I needed him and he needed me because we served whatever purpose we served for each other. And we didn't, you know, so you just, you just go along as robots with this addictive quality to your relationship. But when you see that your own happiness is generated from inside of you and you don't need anybody else to give you that, you can have a relationship on a on a real basis, you know, based on something real, not based on addiction and neediness and, and, and I mean, just that alone. And again, just one person is all it takes that changes the quality of the relationship immensely. So it's, it's not even like the same relationship for me. Wow. How did you realize? How did you come to that realization? It's like, we have so much thinking in our blind spot that we're not aware of. So how I, did it come to that? I had a major insight about addiction in general um, at one point. I had been watching a lot of Three Principles things about addiction. First, I was like, I don't care about addiction ones. Those, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't need that. And so I sort of left all those videos for last. But then I started watching them and I was like, huh, I started really like it was hitting me that all of life is one big addiction. We're just trying to feel better you know, we're looking towards things and people and situations to feel better. And then mm -hmm. after that, like I was in the shower one day and it just hit me. I saw in a flash all my addictive relationships and it was, it was friendships and things throughout my life. Um, and just in drinking and stuff like that, I saw it all. I said, huh, if thoughts create my feelings and happiness is always inside of me, 
then me looking to these other people for my happiness is ridiculous because it's already there inside of me. I'm creating it anyway. And poof, like I saw that my whole life flashed before my eyes. And, and after that, it, it, the interesting thing is it changed my drinking pattern, my, my alcohol. I wasn't even thinking of it in terms of alcohol, but I, after that, I did not need or want, I, I still can drink alcohol, but I don't, want it the same way I don't want to feel that feeling it used to give me because now I I just feel that my you know in I know that that's the my default state and anything else just makes it worse so I so that translated then to my relationship as well because I just saw oh well I don't need him to be happy I mean I like to be with him but if something happens and I'm not, I will, I know that I will be okay. And so I don't have that neediness quality anymore, or the clinginess, and I still can fall back <laughs> into it. But for the most part, I know, you know, I know deep down at least that I'm, I'm fine with or without him or, or anything. And that came to you as an insight. Yeah, insight. that's, <laughs> that's where true change comes, you know, it's you have an the insight. only way. Yeah everything changes across the board. And in fact, you have a book out. So will you say the name of the book and yes, how people- my book, my book is called, um, now I just forgot. <laughs> it's called Victim of Thought, Seeing Through the Illusion of Anxiety. And um, because, and, you know, that's really what, what I saw was that my anxiety was creating you know, that I had anxiety my whole life and that was creating these addictive patterns and that was, you know, just everything in my life. My, I, I am starting an, another book too that will be about relationships. That's my next one too. So oh. I don't have a title yet, but because I, I have seen so much from relation, you know, through with relationships through this stuff. And for me, it, everything, so much of it just stemmed from anxiety, which I still have. You can see I'm getting all red just talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that book. I, I read that book and I, I refer clients dealing with anxiety to your book. I couldn't remember oh. the name either, but I remember the cover of The Scream, the famous painting, The Scream. Yes, thankfully that's yeah. under, um, um, in the public domain. So I, I was able to use that. People like the cover. Yeah, it's wonderful. So what else? We have about 15 more minutes or so. That's a good question. Um, let me see what comes to me. Oh, we were talking about how um, even if one person gains an understanding of the inside out nature of the human experience, it will have an effect on your partner. Okay. You, you don't you know, it's really important, again, that you don't need the other person to learn and see and understand what you've come to see. You can share uh, what it is, but not make a big deal about it. Bill Pettit talks about his wife, Linda, that when they first got together, after his first wife passed away, and Linda and he were dating, you know, Bill, he talks about the principles just as, like people drink water, you know? <laughs> um, so, of course, he was talking to her while they were dating, and she said to him, it's really cute, she said, Bill, I really like you, but you have to promise me not to talk about the principles anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you both heard that story. From I <laughs> So he said, okay, oh, I didn't know it was bothering you. And he stopped. He just stopped talking about it to her. And they had some traumatic event happen to them, and she was so taken by how he handled it so calmly and was so unusual for somebody to respond that clear with that degree of clarity. She came around and she said, so why, how did that happen? And did it have anything to do with that? those three principles we're talking about? <laughs> he said, yeah, it had all to do with that. So she said, well, teach me. I want to know. And now she, nice. 
travels around the world teaching with him. Yeah. 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 She was a, um, a dean of, was it Siena State University, I think, in the Midwest uh, before she retired. And uh, she brought it into the entire counseling department of Siena State University. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think what one of the big things when you're holding, so when you have the understanding and you're holding that space, you kind of switch from, you know, I mean, because the other person, whether they, you know, okay, so the, let's say you've got the situation where you're the one learning and the other person doesn't know yet. So they still think it's you affecting them. The system is still always, I mean, that's why their principles, the system, even their system, even without knowing their system is still designed to return to functioning healthfully, right? And, and the less that you kind of throw at them and put into their, you know, busy thinking, you know, why, why, why didn't you take me on a date? It's so easy. I asked you, I asked you, you know, it's like they've got, you know, you're adding to their busy thinking. And then, um, and then it's harder for them, for their system to naturally reset because, you know, I mean, we've all been there, the, the busier and busier your kind of, you know, small mind gets, the harder it is to reset and come to that place of calm. And so I think that's one big, there are many factors, but I think that's one of them when you're the one, you know, taking on learning this understanding your own head clears, your own system resets more frequent, you know, more frequently, more easily. You live in a quieter space, a quieter feeling. And so I think naturally the other person is also able to reset more quickly, more easily and live in a quieter feeling because you're not adding to the noise they still have in their head. Um, I think that's one of the things. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. What what you I, I like that word reset. I use the word resilient a lot. Mm -hmm. Reset is another way. Yeah, we're we're designed to just bounce back to our innate health. Yeah, and when we're not constantly at attacking them because we yeah. think they're doing stuff to us, they don't have to be on the defensive as much mm -hmm. anymore because when you know when we're on the defensive or when they're on the defensive that's when we you know act act out because our own mind our own thoughts are going crazy so by by giving them that space to you know not making assumptions about what they're doing is bad or wrong that just yeah gets lets them you know relax a little bit and 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 um you know yeah maybe Maybe they don't hate me. <laughs> they can come to their mind, you know. <laughs> well, I'm sure everyone's had that experience, you know, and I'm talking like pre, you know, pre-understanding, pre-learning this, but having that experience where you have, you know, the critical boss or the critical friend or, you know, someone who, critical parent, where, you know, you're with them and you just kind of get this Sometimes they say it out loud, sometimes you don't, but you get the idea that everything you're doing is wrong. And it's kind of tricky to navigate that, you know, when, because then you think that you need to do something different to the, you know, you, you get into this back and forth where, and so, you know, I think that's, that that's it. Exactly what you were saying, Jill, as soon as you're not like bashing them all the time, or even, or even living in the feeling, because even if you're not saying it out loud, I think people know anyway when you're, you know, criticizing them in your head, because, you know, your body language is different. You kind of give them dirty looks. You're, it's, it's a different experience being with someone who's kind of judging you all the time and being with someone who's just letting you be who you are. And I have a, I have a story about that as well from, from, 20 years ago before I, I learned the principles, I was at the end of my rope with my husband for all, you know, various reasons. And I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I had three little kids at the time and, and I was just like, I don't know what to do. And I was, I was on my parenting chat room, this was back in the nineties <laughs> and somebody said, and I was, you know, complaining or whatever. And somebody said, well, have you tried forgiveness? 
And I'm like, mm. what's that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not religious. I don't know anything. You know, I didn't, nobody in my family ever forgave anyone. That wasn't the thing. So, um, you know, I'm like, well, tell me more about this forgiveness. Then like, you just, just forgive him, you know? And I'm like, you can do that. And, and this person, I don't even know if, I don't remember if it was a male or female They're They're like, yeah, just do it. I'm like, well, do I have to tell him? No, you don't have to tell him. You can, if you want, but you, you know, if you just do it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, I was so naive, like, cause I really, I didn't have anything on it. I'm like, just like, I'm at the end of my rope. I'll give this a shot. And, and I, and I, I did. I just was like, went back later that day to myself. Somehow, I don't know what I, I don't really remember what I did. I was just like, okay, I forgive him. And, and it was, a, it was a miracle. <laughs> it was, I suddenly, you know, I, I really did forgive. Like people talk about forgiveness, but if you don't really do it, you know, it, it, I think the person had said, you know, it's like a, a new chapter in a book, kind of like, you know, you're starting a new chapter in the book. And I, and that's what, I thought about when as I did that and it really was like I mean when my husband came home from work and I did I did not tell him I had I never told him that I forgave him I did finally a few years ago but that was like 20 years later um I never told him but things just changed again like I suddenly all the stuff I was holding on to in my head that I was mad about was gone because we were starting a new page and and I saw him differently. And so I was nicer to him. I wasn't, didn't have all that anger and, and, and criticalness in my head about him and things just changed. It's, it's such a miraculous thing. And it, it always makes me sad when, when people can't do it. And, you know, they say, I just can't do it. It would be like condoning, you know, the behavior and, or like my mother, my mother said that would be selling my soul to the devil if I forgave <laughs> certain person you know and I'm like no it's the oh, opposite yes. of it's the opposite you're selling your soul to the devil if you don't forgive because you're mm -hmm. killing yourself you know you're you're then this burden is on you um it's it's to me if, you know for any relationship that's it's it comes in handy <laughs> and it's it's really easy even though people think it's hard yeah, it's it's like second nature when you realize they're doing the best they can, given how they're thinking about things right now. We all, every human being is doing the best they can, given how they're thinking about things. Yeah. Bill yeah, Pettit told this story when he was um, here in Hartford a, a few years back that he went to see a young fellow in prison who was in prison because he had shot the principal of his school. And this person said to Bill, you know, Bill was the psychiatrist going in, I guess, to do an evaluation or something. And the, the young fellow said to him, you know, as I was walking down the corridor, so intent on getting rid of this guy with the gun in my hand, there was a soft voice, the voice of reason. I don't know if the guy said that or not, but he said there was this very quiet voice that says, you don't have to do this. Mm. There will be consequences for this and you don't have to do this. But his thinking, his thoughts that he had to do this just drowned out the wisdom and can you imagine, I mean, if that fellow knew anything about we feel our thinking and how important it is to quiet the mind so that you can hear wisdom. Wisdom is very quiet and it always comes with a reassuring feeling. Yeah. He would have a different, a different future. Yeah. And, you know, for people who know that, that's a really dramatic story. But knowing that in a relationship, you can see how, how easy it is for people to set the wheels in motion to divorce, as opposed to just calming down in the moment and waiting for both of you to feel better. People love to talk things out they have this idea that they're going to get 
resolution through <laughs> their brain, through their thinking. They've got to get resolution in the moment that they're feeling bad. That is the worst time to talk things out. The opposite yeah. of what we assume. It's really the opposite of that assumption. Calm down first, get into a nice frame of mind, and you know, pour some tea for yourselves and just, you know, talk about what was that all about? How did that happen? And what were you thinking? And so instead of you don't have to talk actually about it. bond more and connect more by getting into what the other person was thinking as ridiculous as our thinking might have been. Well, and that's it. Sometimes you don't even have to talk about it because it was not, you know, it was made up uh, thought thinking in the moment on either or both of your parts and it doesn't need talking about because it, it passes you know it, it, it so it's funny the whole you know talk try to talk it out thing a lot of, i mean a lot of times just don't <laughs> just don't Absolutely. And, it, and it disappears that's so true you know clients come in they had this big argument they had to call me right away and they come in and they can't even remember <laughs> what argument was over. I can't tell you how many times that happens. So you're absolutely right. I'm glad you brought that up. That and that's the time people want to. That's what talking about. It's over. Right. And it's the same with anxiety. People will message me now because of my book and they'll be like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a horrible, anxious state right now. What can I do? And I, and you know, I'm like, well, nothing, <laughs> you're already in it, you know? So when you're in it, that's when you want the help, but just, you know, if you let it go and you see about, you see, look at it later, maybe you might be able to see at least how it happened and, and, and learn something from it then. But when you're in the midst of this stuff, it's fine, you know, right. You gotta ride it out. If you can't, if you haven't caught it early enough where you say, Oh, I see this as thought. You know, if you can feel the feelings and notice that, say, anxiety is coming on or you're getting mad at your partner or whatever it is. And if you notice it early enough and see that it's thought, sometimes you can, you know, it, it can dissipate faster. But when you're caught up in it, don't worry about it. Just try and ride it out. Uh, I think at least that's what works for me. Well, so we're coming up on time mm -hmm. here. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that we are going to do two more of these webinars. Um, one on business relationships is that the next one or and then one on i think what's the other one family family mm -hmm. family like parents and kids parents and, and, and that kids, kind yeah. of stuff so um Thanks. and the next one i think is the 20th do i have that right same time the ne um, next um 25th, East Coast time. 25th oh 25 11 a.m okay. eastern time on business relationships Oh, okay. And we'll, and we'll post we'll post information about that. Any last words, anybody? I don't think so. Yeah. And again, the um the the real the the real all day workshop where we'll be talking about all this stuff and and much more uh, is on November fourth in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, we'll have a link. I'll I'll post a link to it when we post the recording. We have an Eventbrite. You can um you can um, get tickets there and it's it's only somewhere in the hundred dollar range um so we hope maybe people you know you can fly in connecticut's beautiful in um november i guess <laughs> as long as it's not snowing it doesn't usually snow yet um so, good yeah. segue it's a good segue into the holiday season you know because so many relationship things get stirred up around the holidays and expectations. That's another thing we didn't talk about. Oh, <laughs> There's so much to talk about. That's why coming to a seminar, an all day seminar is really great because we'll come. Yeah. And that's so that's a great point because yeah, you this will this will give you a, a good boost of a good shot of three Ps to, <laughs> to, to to carry you through the holiday season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Well thank you ladies. Thank you, Thank you for listening in. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy um, your sunny day in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's yoga now. <laughs> nice to meet you, I, I, uh, Christine. Nice to meet yeah. you, Christian. Take okay. care. Yeah. Bye-bye. Well, um, bye-bye. I'll, bye -bye. I'll have this recording posted shortly. So um, bye, everyone. Have a good, have a good day. <laughs>